mérite et qui participe à la, qui a participé à la préparation de cette deuxième édition consécutive dans ces mêmes lieux du Forum Social Mondial et du Forum Sciences et Démocratie, de vous souhaiter à toutes et à tous la bienvenue dans notre université, dans notre pays. Votre présence vous honore énormément en ces périodes, en cette période relativement difficile que traverse notre pays, mais que traverse le monde entier, il faut l'avouer, puisque ce, cette engraine qui est le terrorisme international est due à une dimension qui touche tous les pays sans exception. Nous sommes donc tous concernés par ce, ce phénomène-là et nous appelons les peuples du monde entier, nous en fait tous partie, et de vous agissez puisqu'il s'agit d'une société de la société civile euh, qui est, comme vous le savez, relativement forte en Tunisie, qui a su défendre les acquis de ce pays sur tous les plans, et c'est grâce à notre société civile en Tunisie qu'on a pu préserver un certain nombre d'acquis, mais aussi développer d'autres, puisque comme vous le savez, les objectifs de notre révolution sont partiellement réalisés, notamment en matière de démocratie. On a le mérite d'avoir choisi la voie la plus difficile, celle qui consiste à rédiger une nouvelle constitution par une assemblée nationale constituante. Et c'est une voie relativement difficile. Les choses étaient tellement difficiles qu'à un certain moment, on croyait ne pas pouvoir arriver au bout du, du tunnel, mais Dieu merci, on, a, on est arrivé grâce à cet esprit de consensus qui s'est développé dans notre pays, à rédiger une constitution qui est plus démocratique pour nous, une constitution moderne, et à réaliser surtout des élections législatives et des élections présidentielles reconnues par tout le monde comme étant des élections transparentes et démocratiques. Le reste du chemin est long, certainement, comme après toutes les révolutions, mais on est sûr, grâce à votre appui, grâce à l'appui des gens qui sont pour la liberté, pour la dignité et pour le, le, les peuples opprimés, les peuples qui, 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 qui sont en train de lutter pour se créer un chemin pour, au niveau de la réalisation de la démocratie au niveau de la réalisation des objectifs de cette révolution, on est sûr qu'on ne parvient pas à réaliser grâce à votre accord. Et on est vraiment content que vous soyez à nos côtés en ces moments difficiles. Tout en étant conscient que les ramifications du terrorisme sont un peu partout dans le monde, elles concernent aussi bien des organisations, mais aussi des États qui se réclament démocratiques. Donc, encore une fois, bienvenue en Tunisie, merci d'être venu et bon séjour parmi nous dans l'université de Tunis El Mala qui est fier de vous accueillir dans cet espace, euh, dans cet espace qui est destiné à développer toutes les formes de coopération, donc à lutter contre toutes les formes d'extrémisme. Merci encore une fois. Nous avons fait valoir l'idée que les sciences et les technologies 
Après un vote primordial à jouer pour accompagner un développement souhaité et souhaitable de nos sociétés. Mais pas n'importe quelle science et pas n'importe quelle technologie. Le progrès pour le progrès n'a pas de sens. Il en a d'autant moins quand il est piloté par une industrie en mal de profit et qui n'a aucun scrupule à imposer sa vision du monde jusque dans, jusque dans les laboratoires de recherche publique. Sa prétention à vouloir sauver l'humanité et la planète en excluant les peuples de la prise de décision n'est pas acceptable. Nous ne l'acceptons pas, nous ne l'accepterons pas. Démocratiser les choix scientifiques et techniques, contrôler les technologies émergentes, permettre aux scientifiques et aux citoyens organisés de travailler ensemble, de lutter pour la justice climatique, de refonder les programmes éducatifs du primaire à l'université sont autant de défis auxquels nous, nous faisons face. Autant de défis que nous relèverons au cours des trois demi journées de travail dans les années à venir pour les transformer en action, en plaidoyer et en lutte commune. Ce n'est qu'ensemble, chercheurs et militants associatifs, enseignants et représentants des institutions publiques, citoyens et mouvements sociaux, que nous parviendrons à rompre la logique dominante de la pensée unique qui nous mène droit le mur. Ce ne sera pas une tâche facile, mais cela ne nous effraie pas. Je vous parlais il y a quelques instants de l'histoire de notre forum. De nombreuses organisations nous ont accompagnés au cours de ces dernières années. De nombreuses personnalités nous ont apporté leur soutien et leur bienveillance. Deux d'entre elles nous ont quittés récemment. Et nous nous devions de leur rendre hommage aujourd'hui. Quelques mois après le forum de 2013, nous perdions notre ami Dino Draga. Je suis entouré de ses proches et de ses camarades de lutte qui vont renommer sa mémoire au travers de ses engagements et ses combats pour la paix, l'éducation, la science, la souveraineté alimentaire, le soutien aux victimes du développement déraisonné, le droit humain, la construction collective et alternative. Parmi ces multiples engagements, Dino avait accompagné le Forum mondial Science et Démocratie depuis ses débuts. Il y a deux semaines de cela, c'est la deuxième Magda Zanoni qui nous quittait à son tour. Magda avait lancé une association science citoyenne au Brésil lors d'une conférence organisée par le Forum mondial sur et démocratie au sommet des peuples de Rio plus 20 en 2012. Elle avait porté sa bonne humeur et ses combats ici même à Tunis il y a deux ans. Si vous me permettez, je vais lire quelques lignes écrites par une. Pardon, je vais. Je vais lire quelques lignes écrites par une de ses proches, Suzanne Anderset. Magda a lutté toute sa vie contre les dictatures, contre les injustices de toutes sortes, pour les petits pêcheurs, paysans et paysannes, les femmes, les exclus. Dans sa carrière universitaire et professionnelle, elle n'a pas oublié ses combats. Depuis sa thèse sur la réforme agraire au Portugal après la révolution des œillets, jusqu'à son travail au sein du ministère brésilien de la réforme agraire, celle-ci devient une réalité. Magda est exilée en France et est retournée au Brésil à la fin de la dictature et après la victoire de Lula. Elle a pu mettre ses compétences et ses engagements pour un, pardon, et ses engagements pour un autre, pour un autre Brésil en France. Magda est une universitaire qui, le terrain, était la base de sa pratique scientifique et militante. Une, ense une enseignante qui suivait et accompagnait ses étudiants dans cette même démarche. Elle a participé à tant de relations sociales et de lutte politique depuis le Larzac jusqu'à l'expérience de formation interdisciplinaire sur le développement durable à l'Université fédérale de Curitiba. Magda est dans son amitié fidèle, généreuse. Elle était pleine de vie, de force, d'engagement, de conviction et d'attention aux jeunes qui devaient se lancer dans la vie professionnelle. Elle nous laisse qu'elle aurait tellement voulu continuer à mener. Pour honorer Vinod et Magda, ces deux justes de la cause altermondialiste, je vous propose non pas une minute de silence, mais je vous invite à vous lever et à les applaudir.
Is there a, a translator, an uh, English translator from here, please? Someone able to, uh, to translate from French to English? Est-ce que quelqu'un peut venir chuchoter pour euh, Robert, Saoui, Abdallah et Halatami qui m'ont grandement aidé et soutenu au cours des dernières semaines et des derniers mois. J'ai également une pensée pour ma compagne et mon garçon qui ont dû subir des tumeurs euh, changeantes au cours des dernières semaines. Grand merci également à l'ensemble des volontaires, ce sont des personnes avec euh, des vestes bleues qui vont nous accompagner tout au long du forum et qui vont nous guider euh, à l'intérieur du forum social mondial et du forum mondial sur ces démocraties. Je remercie aussi énormément les techniciens de Nomad 08 qui font des efforts énormes pour nous permettre de, de mieux échanger entre nous. Et évidemment, je vous remercie tous, participants et intervenants, pour votre confiance. A vous tous, un énorme merci. Au nom de la Fondation Sciences Citoyennes que je représente ici et qui m'a permis d'organiser ce quatrième forum sur ces démocraties, je nous souhaite à toutes et tous, collectivement, dans un esprit d'ouverture et de dialogue, de dépasser nos divergences, de briser les barrières culturelles et politiques qui nous séparent, de construire et renforcer les ponts entre science, recherche, éducation, société et démocratie. Nous devons faire de ce quatrième forum mondial Sciences et démocratie et du forum social mondial le marche-pied vers un monde écologiquement et socialement plus juste. Ça n'a pas l'école que la paix soit avec nous. Je cède immédiatement la parole à Anita Rampal, qui, nous, qui vient d'Inde et qui était la compagne de Pilote Raïka, à qui nous rendons hommage aujourd'hui. Nous avions initialement prévu de projeter un, un, un court film à propos de Pilote, mais vous comprendrez bien que vu les re, le retard que nous avons pris, il sera impossible de le faire. Donc nous allons nous contenter de, de, de projeter une présentation avec les différents hommages qui nous ont été rendus dans le monde. Merci beaucoup. It is very heartwarming to be here amongst all uh, my Lord's friends and yet very strange to be at the World Soul Show Forum without him. Uh, I will talk a bit about his work and also about the larger questions about science and democracy which were part of his work, were part of our work and still are still the agenda of a lot of science activists across the globe. Um, I'd like to say that uh, Vinod was a youth uh, during the late 60s and early 70s. And um, when he was in university, he was very influenced by a lot that was happening in other parts of the world, <coughs> including in France and in some parts of our country the movement of the youth revolution, the movement of young people really trying to question established truths. As a scientist, uh, as a physicist at that time, there were hardly any people, very few people who were even socialized to talk about things other than physics, especially things like poetry or poverty. Uh, our education was such that we came very, it was, it, even the discourse of science was such that there was hardly any human agency and especially hardly any subjectivities involved. So for us, younger people who were coming in, that itself was a struggle at that time. Uh, we know, even as a master's student in the physics department, was um, questioning the syllabus of the master's courses, the way those things were being taught and why were they being taught. 
So there was a group which was then trying to, in a democratic fashion, work with some of the younger teachers to say that, can we think of teaching physics a bit differently? Uh, many of us were inspired by a young group of physicists who had worked uh, in American universities or worked outside India and had come there very consciously in an idealistic manner to come and develop Indian departments, Indian science departments. Uh, both Vinod and I, our supervisors, had worked with eminent Nobel laureates. Vinod's supervisor was a, was a student of Dalits. My supervisor was a student of Shweba. And uh, we were really inspired. Those were the heady, heady days of being in physics uh, in India, in Delhi University. But along with that, there, uh, even these young people, these idealists who had come back to India, there was a lot of questioning of the science establishment as it ran then. Unfortunately, much of it continues even today. When uh, you don't question the big names, you don't question the big names in science, you don't question even your supervisors, and uh, especially the very big names don't really encourage younger scientists. So we were lucky to be in that movement at that time within the department and also engage with work in rural schools. There was a program in central India, Madhya Pradesh, in which rural government schools, because they were in such a bad condition, the government had given, said yes to an NGO, which was looking for scientists, science volunteers, to come and work for science education. And because things were so bad, the administration and the government said that yes, even though they don't have an education background, but they, things are so bad that they can't make it worse. So on that condition, we were allowed to come and start working with the school teachers. And what does science really mean for a young child? What does science mean in a resource-starved school? But yet, what kind of science can also, also engage culturally and uh, in a way that you can think of self-reliance, even if you're in a very uh, resource-starved school in a remote village. I want to say that those were sort of that heady moment of doing science and then also questioning science, but also a constructive way of questioning, a constructive critique, because to be engaged in restructuring it also. That was a very, very uh, empowering moment for many of us. And uh, when we started going out to the village schools, this was in the early 70s, um, not only did we learn physics in a much liberated manner, because some of our teachers came and in the environment of the village schools, in the, in the free environment of living together and working together, we were also learning our science much better but we were also engaging with questions which till today bother us. Um, it was also very, of course, um, they, as I said, there were heavy moments. Uh, on a lighter note, I can say that for me, it became a bit too heavy sometimes when this male-dominated boys club of physics also sat in a closed room full of smoke because they were mostly smokers and I would find my head going very heady even at that time with all the smoke around me. But that was also a time when we were questioning hierarchies within the way science was structured, not just in the discourse, uh, but also in terms of who are the participants and whose knowledge really counts. So we tried uh, to restructure the textbooks along with teachers, not like experts coming from the top, uh, but along with school teachers, along with uh, uh, children who were mostly from an agriculture background, and also trying to give the edge differently in terms of, even if you do a science quiz, 
It is not going to be an individual giving you a pat answer like it happens even today. I'm very smart, I give a quick answer so you come and pat me and say how smart you are. But deliberately the quiz was in a collective manner. Teams had to think about what they were going to say. They had to come and do something, not just give a smart answer but actually to do with their hands because the whole effort was doing with their hands through locally available materials, materials that people could set up equipment, not fancy equipment coming from the urban centers. But also the questions were more to do with people who knew the soil, people who knew the farming, who knew agriculture and local knowledge to giving an edge to people's knowledge. Uh, so that was the kind of struggle that started in the 70s that Virod was very much a part of. And from that, uh, he got involved in a larger network of the people science groups about which I'm sure uh, others will be talking, uh, especially after the Bhopal gas disaster. When the Union Carbide disaster happened in Bhopal, you know, it was stationed in Bhopal, and a lot of the groups who had been working on different issues on health, on water, on uh, environment, on education, of science, science policy, they formed a large network and said that we need a coordinated federal structure like this people's science network to take up these issues in a much more concerted manner. And trying to work with different groups who might have had different differences, different opinions, even different ideologies about how to proceed was difficult, but I have learned, I've seen that Vinod was one of those people who could try and get people together because not all of us can do that. And uh, from that, uh, he got involved, this whole uh, movement came into a literacy and development movement because the science groups, which were at that time more in terms of uh, academics or academic intellectuals, and people working in policy decided that literacy really was the basic issue in our country. And it was so because a lot of people were being pushed out of education, they were being pushed out of schooling at a very young age, being told that you're not smart enough to do education. And I must say that science and maths are structured in that way that most people get the feeling that they are not good enough. So because of that, uh, the groups decided to work in a literacy campaign in inspired by Paulo Freire's critical pedagogy and a critical approach to knowledge and education. And that movement then became a more grassroots movement. It's continuing today despite all kinds of difficult times and India has seen a change of government, a loss of support for, for uh, activists and environmental and grassroots work and yet uh, that work has continued. It was really at the peak in the 90s when the literacy campaign achieved a lot of participatory mobilization and from that uh, uh, the next phase of Vinod's work was to work for the right to education because even 60 years after independence and after India became independent, more than half the children, and this runs in uh, you know, tens of millions, were not finishing elementary school, not finishing even eight years of school. So large numbers of children being pushed out of school. And that was the time when we realized that this literacy issue is really connected with pushing out children right from schooling, the nature of the schooling itself. Who is getting schooling and what kind? So that itself became a major struggle and a major mobilization. And he was one of the protagonists of this uh, Right to Education Act. He was in the drafting committee. And politically, it meant getting a lot of consensus from different kinds of political lobbies and groups. And it was an achievement that in 2010, this act was passed and it's being implemented. It is another question uh, that currently the government seems to be going back on many things, but the struggle is on. And uh, the fact that it's the right of every child to learn and learn well and learn with 
uh, an open mind and learn to question is something that is uh, still a challenge for us, as I'm sure it's a challenge in many countries. We can have people coming into school, we can have people coming into sciences, but it's not necessary that we are learning to actually critique and question, have dissent in a many constructive manner. So, uh, in, in some of these things, uh, I do say that that struggle continues, that struggle needs solidarity across boundaries, across nations, uh, because uh, in this way, uh, even when uh, one country has developed certain resources and certain people to work on certain agendas and certain ideas, I think this kind of solidarity is crucial to continue this work. Thank you. Merci beaucoup Anita. Je vais maintenant céder la parole à Kusmacia. Donc euh, Fabien a rendu l'hommage que tous ceux qui la connaissent euh, ont euh, évidemment en tête pour Magda Zanoni, qui nous a accompagnés pendant tellement longtemps au niveau du forum social mondial et de toutes les luttes altermondialistes. Et euh, maintenant, je vais plutôt parler de Vinod, puisque euh, c'est l'hommage à Vinod qui caractérise cette, euh, cette première journée. Bien, il y a des moments privilégiés où euh, on reconnaît, où on rencontre quelqu'un qu'on reconnaît comme son frère. Et Vinod, euh, pour moi, ça a été ça. Euh, très vite, nous nous sommes rencontrés et très vite, euh, nous nous sommes trouvés. Et pour moi, ça a été vraiment un frère dans toute cette aventure extraordinaire du Forum Social Media. Et Anita a été souvent là et ça a été toujours pour nous quelque chose d'assez extraordinaire. Si Vinod était là, il nous aurait dit, il aurait pu nous dire que nous sommes pressés et nous avons le temps. Et il aurait rajouté, et ce serait assis, il aurait attendu un peu, il a dit Nous savons que c'est très difficile de commencer un forum social Et donc, ne nous énervons pas sur les problèmes d'organisation, de sécurité. Nous sommes là et nous allons continuer et nous allons trouver des nouvelles choses. Nous allons découvrir. Et ça, c'était la force de Vinod. C'était qu'il était toujours prêt à découvrir. Toujours à l'écoute. Il a été un des fondateurs de l'intermondialisme. Et pour lui, l'intermondialisme, c'était une nouvelle étape. Mais ce n'était pas un commencement. C'était un moment dans la lutte des peuples. Une des formes que se donnent les peuples pour réagir, pour agir à la situation dans laquelle ils sont et pour imaginer d'autres choses, d'autres futurs. Et donc, il s'était toujours retrouvé, il avait participé à la création du mot d'ordre du Forum Social Mondial. Un autre monde est possible. Et un autre monde est nécessaire. Et c'est cette tension entre le possible et le nécessaire qui caractérise le Forum Social Mondial. Et Vinod, il a été tout à fait au début et à l'origine avec d'autres de ce qui caractérise le Forum Social Mondial, c'est-à-dire la convergence des mouvements, l'importance des mouvements sociaux et des mouvements citoyens. Je me rappelle, il nous a dit un jour au niveau du Conseil international, pourquoi nous parlons des mouvements 
Et il a dit, en 1994 à Hiroshima, il y a eu une rencontre organisée pour le 50 e de la bombe de Hiroshima. Et il y avait un certain nombre de mouvements, surtout d'Asie. Et l'idée, c'était « a global coalition of peoples » une coalition globale des peuples. Et quelqu'un a dit, mais qui va représenter les peuples C'est pas les États, c'est pas les partis, c'est les mouvements. C'est les mouvements. C'est ça. Un mouvement, ça s'inscrit dans l'histoire, ça s'inscrit dans le temps, et ça relie des individus et du collectif. Et c'est cette culture politique que Finod a tellement bien représentée. Nous sommes des individus, nous avons de la spécificité et nous sommes unis. Nous construisons ensemble du collectif. Et ça, ça se fait continuellement. Ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est donné, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est défini par quelqu'un d'en haut. Je pense que cette convergence des mouvements, cette ouverture à tous les mouvements, comment reconnaître un mouvement Et Pilote était très curieux des mouvements. Il savait reconnaître des nouveaux mouvements. Et il savait voir qu'est-ce qui a mené quelque chose de nouveau dans l'univers des mouvements. Et puis, il a apporté quelque chose de très fondamental dans le forum social mondial. Il a amené l'idée que le forum social mondial, ce n'était pas une extension de l'occidental et sortie. Ce n'était pas l'Europe et l'Amérique dominantes mais qui allait être représenté par des mouvements européens ou américains. Il savait que, justement, l'irruption des mouvements africains, asiatiques, latino-américains, ça représentait un pas en avant dans l'histoire de l'humanité. Et d'ailleurs, quand on regarde l'Amérique latine, nous en discutons souvent ensemble, on disait, mais qu'est-ce que c'est la révolution de l'Amérique latine ben, La révolution de l'Amérique latine, c'est brutalement l'arrivée des latinos, des indiens, des noirs. C'est la nouvelle civilisation. Et c'est ça que nous retrouvons dans le forum. Et donc, euh, il avait cette conscience que le forum, ce n'était pas seulement l'élargissement à des nouvelles régions. C'était l'élargissement à des nouvelles cultures et à de nouvelles civilisations. Et c'est ça qui était important. Je me rappelle un jour, il était venu dans une réunion sur les questions écologiques. C'était en France d'ailleurs. Et tout le monde parlait de l'importance du climat et de l'eau. Et il avait dit, vous savez, en Inde, L'eau, c'est sacré. L'eau, c'est pas seulement une ressource. C'est du sacré. Est-ce que vous comprenez la différence qu'il y a entre ce que l'on voit et ce que l'on considère comme du sacré Et cette capacité de construire un pont entre les civilisations, c'était ça qu'il a porté et qu'il a représenté, et c'est ça le forum social mondial. C'est ça sa richesse, et c'est ça ce qu'il a de nouveau. Et pour ça, Vinod, il était très intéressé, très fortement demandeur d'un débat sur les questions de stratégie sur les questions intellectuelles, sur la question de la science. 
Et pour lui, la science, ce n'était pas une accumulation de connaissances. Ce n'était pas ce qui devait diriger le monde. Je dis pour lui, la science, c'était une question de méthode fondamentale. Je la caractérisais comme ça. La liberté d'inventer. Et c'est pour ça que la science est liée à la liberté. Et l'obligation de vérifier. Et c'est là que la science est une des formes de lutte contre les autres plus entiers. Cette obligation de vérifier, cette liaison entre la liberté d'inventer et l'obligation de vérifier. C'est ça. Et justement, effectivement, c'est pour ça que pour Vidal, ce qui était très important dans le débat, c'était d'aller au fond des choses. Et effectivement, il était toujours très intéressé par tous les débats fondamentaux sur la question stratégique. Et il avait une énorme culture, parce que c'était une culture multicivilisationnelle. Parce que c'était une culture qui était capable de voir ce qu'il y avait de commun entre les civilisations et ce qu'il y avait de spécifique. Et du point de vue du forum, il savait aussi que ce n'est pas uniquement au niveau intellectuel que l'on pouvait progresser, qu'il fallait aussi, justement, porter une très grande attention aux questions, justement, de l'organisation, de la manière d'être ensemble, de construire ensemble. Et, par exemple, au conseil de Abuja, c'est lui qui avait dit « La charte des principes ne suffit pas. Il faut que nous réfléchissions sur les problèmes de financement, les problèmes d'utilisation des nouvelles technologies. Comment on organise un forum ?» Et c'est lui qui a rédigé, avec quelques autres, les formes d'organisation des forums sociaux mondiaux. Non pas la charte des principes qui avait été faite, mais la manière d'organiser les forums sociaux mondiaux. Et l'importance de la nouvelle culture politique portée par les forums. L'horizontalité, la construction du consensus, les activités autogérées, la diversité, la manière de vivre ensemble dans la diversité. Et c'est ce que représentent les mouvements. Parce qu'un mouvement, il est spécifique. Il naît de la manière dont les gens considèrent qu'il y a des choses inacceptables. Et puis, il est universel. Parce que il dit, nous voulons une émancipation, nous voulons une libération. Et donc, euh, il parle du spécifique et il essaye de construire le universel. Et ça, Vinod était un de ceux qui avait le plus compris parmi nous et qui était toujours prêt à le répéter. Et de ce point de vue, je ne veux pas être le fond, c'est moi, je pense que pour nous, Vinod, c'était en même temps la rigueur et la douceur. Il était extrêmement attentif à ce que disaient les autres. Il écoutait. Il écoutait. Et un jour, en plaisantant, je lui avais dit, mais au fond, tu es bien d'accord avec Confucius quand il disait, il faut trois ans pour apprendre à parler, mais il faut une vie pour apprendre à se taire. Et lui, il savait écouter. Il savait, il, il prenait la parole après avoir écouté. Et cette écoute, c'était très important. Et en même temps, il y avait aussi cette fermeté. Par exemple, je me rappelle quand il disait, mais quand nous avons organisé le forum de Mumbai, nous avons dit, mais si on veut être altermondialiste, eh bien, il faut passer par les logiciels libres. Nous allons interdire Microsoft sur l'espace du forum. 
Et effectivement, il y avait eu dans ce forum de Mumbai une vraie réflexion. Est-ce qu'on peut construire un autre monde en reprenant les logiciels de Microsoft Et donc, effectivement, il était toujours en même temps ouvert. Il était en même temps prêt à écouter. Et en même temps, il rappelait toujours la nécessité d'une fermeté. Eh bien, je pense que nous n'oublierons pas le code et il nous accompagnera dans toute la suite des fonds. Merci. I now give the floor to Pat Moody from Canada. Je cède maintenant la parole à Pat Moody du Canada. Thank you very much. There's uh, the biggest heroes in any social forum are the interpreters. Uh, who have to struggle through all kinds of conditions to, to help us talk to each other. And I thank them today, and I apologize for uh, my English and uh, my tendency also to speak too rapidly. So if you, uh, if I am speaking too quickly, please you know, tell me to slow down. Try to avoid this if you can. But, uh, I'll try to speak slowly. I met Meet Up through the social forums. I read about it, heard about it long before that. But I remember hearing him talking about education. And education is something, quite honestly, that I don't tend to think much about until I heard him. The, to me, education was a bit of a mirage, and its role seemed to be often exploited. And you know, it put me where I had to think differently about it, and think about those ways in which we could work together. Those of us who look at the world from different angles, those of us who come to look at our world from the experience of academia and those who come to look at our world from other backgrounds and my involvement mostly with agriculture, with peasant movements and food sovereignty. So I learned from him to open my mind and think better. But I want to challenge us today to continue that openness and to continue to think of ways we can work together that perhaps we, we don't do very well, and I certainly don't do very well. Let me take a minute to describe where we are in terms of our environment, our ecosystems, planetary security. And then from there, what kind of education and what kind of cooperation can we bring together to make the world better. And what I'm going to say doesn't sound very optimistic at the beginning, but I am optimistic. And it's the sort of spirit of, you know, that makes it easy to be optimistic. So let me end at least uh, with that optimistic note. And uh, so don't get too depressed yet. We are in a world where we seem to be losing everything. Where everything seems to be reduced. We're told, for example, that there are 10 billion products available for sale in cities like London or New York. 10 billion different products. But industry tells us those 10 billion products can be made from really a few thousand chemicals, less than a hundred elements in the periodic table. Maybe in some cases, of course, the C, G, T, and A of DNA. So we can reduce that vast diversity of the 10,000 products down to a handful of materials to be manipulated by 
the industrial sector to change our world. And what are they doing in making those products and what have they reduced before our eyes? We now live in a world where every year our machines move more earth than nature, more than the wind and the rain and the earthquakes and the glaciers are able to move. We live in a world where more water is trapped behind dams and in reservoirs and is allowed to flow free in the world. We live in a world where our planet now is experiencing, of course, climate change. Where we talk about if our, are we going to be able to grow food in the next century. We have to realize that we have been growing food for 12,000 years. We are about to experience climatic conditions, growing conditions, that the world has not seen for two million years. So the ability, even of our best minds, even of our indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledge, peasant wisdom, the ability to take our 12,000 years of experience and adapt to two million years of change in the course of one century is challenging. Will we be able to do it? How will we be able to adjust to those dramatic changes? And we live in a world, and this to me is the most terrifying thing of all, where in the course since 1900, we have lost half of the languages of this planet. Where we're losing more than one language every two weeks. Which means that in Latin America, one third of the land mass of Latin America has no one living on it who speaks an indigenous language. Which means that the knowledge of the earth, the knowledge of the flora and the fauna, of the things that can feed us, the things that can cure us, has been lost. We don't know that part of the world anymore. And that loss is continuing. How do we create an environment of cooperation? In the spirit of being on, how do we create a system of education or systems of education that we can work together to respond to these incredible challenges? And how do we also address a world where the changes are so rapid in technologies, where we're being told, whether it's true or not, I'm not sure, but we're being told that most of the world is moving at the pace of Moore's Law. But in fact, in the case of the biosciences, the biological materials, in the case of GMOs and synthetic biology and so on, the world is moving at five times the pace of Moore's Law. Every four months, every four months, the speed of management of DNA doubles. And the cost of doing that management, that manipulation, drops by 50% every four months. How do we create a society and social movements and education to put that together, to let us confront and challenge that changing world and survive, and survive with equity? We need to somehow move, I think, from my fear, and I have to admit here, that I, should, I should admit, that um, I don't have much education. I actually got my high school diploma just a few years ago. And it's an honorary high school diploma. The school had never given one before, but I got an honorary high school diploma. It's a bit like being made an honorary human being, I think. So I've never been to university. So I'm sometimes a bit critical of the university. But again, you know, it's opened my mind to realize there is an important role for high tech. And I want to describe how I would perceive 
how we bring together the knowledge of academia and universities together with the knowledge of indigenous peoples and peasant communities around the world, which I think we can. To me, the knowledge of academia, of high tech, is where it's possible to take a micro innovation, a micro discovery, and apply it into the macro environment, where a change in the manipulation of DNA, where the change in creation of a chemical or a new catalyst can have massive global implications. Whereas the knowledge of indigenous peoples and peasant communities is kind of the reverse. It is where a macro innovation, looking at systems of change, can lead to changes in a micro environment, the micro environment of the farm, the micro environment of the local community, the micro environment of a small ecosystem. It's the capacity of indigenous peoples to see the macro world around them and make the changes that are specific, that are important there. That's, I would argue, is not just high tech, that is wide tech. It is wide technology approaches. We need somehow to move ahead together to bring those two kinds of technologies into genuine integrity and collaboration, the high tech and the wide tech, to confront the world that's before us. But I can't think of anything more embarrassing, more humbling, than to realize that with the loss of indigenous knowledge, around the world in these decades that my generation is the first generation in the history of the world that has lost more knowledge than it has gained. That's a terrible thought. Yes, we have tablets and iPhones and apps. You don't have to worry. You can just be happy. But the reality is that we can't replace that knowledge, that indigenous knowledge of the specific parts of our planet that we need to survive. We have to find some way to struggle to do that. And Vina, in a way that shocked me, has not only shown the openness to how we have to talk to each other and collaborate and find the bridges between our systems of knowledge, but has also brought the charity of dialogue that we need to have to sort out ways that we can work together and through such forums as the social forum. It's an incredibly difficult job. Our world is changing so fast. We've gone from 7,000 different species that we used to grow and eat down to really just 150 around the world. We've gone from 10,000 different livestock species to less than 100 they feed almost all of us in this industrial system. We seem to have lost so much, but in fact, we actually haven't. And the good news for me is, for all that we have lost in the last few decades, in this industrial world of ours, in fact, what we found is that really, science has lost those things. Traditional science has lost those things, but the knowledge is still there and the diversity is really still out there. The work that I've been doing for decades related to seed diversity, for example, we have found that in fact the 7,000 species that we used to use to feed ourselves still exist in the valleys and the hillsides of farming communities around the world. They're still there. They've been lost to science, they have been not lost to the people. And it is possible for us to bring that back, to use that and develop it even further to survive climate change if we work together. But only if we work together. It can be done. There are those ways of communicating. Today, the cutting edge of science is called crowdsourcing. Peasant communities have been crowdsourcing forever. That's how change takes place. 
That's how plant breeding happens. That's how livestock breeding happens. That's how health, health, health and medical challenges are met through the crowdsourcing of local peoples. We need to work it together so all of us crowdsource together to meet the changes we have. And again, these are thoughts I wouldn't have had, would not have thought of this way if it hadn't been for my friend Eli. You know, thank you very much. For Anita to speak about you know because uh, even for some of us uh, even after one and a half years it is difficult for us to speak about you know in the past tense uh, even now I can almost see him sitting somewhere there with that slightly crooked smile of his uh, looking indulgently at us discussing him. Uh, while I was sitting here, I also uh, realized that uh, the social forum in 2013 in Tunis was, I think, the first social forum that Vinod did not attend. He was already uh, unwell at that time. Uh, so uh, Tunis missed being with Vinod, and Vinod missed being with Tunis. Um, I don't know which Vinod I should speak about. Uh, there are, maybe I can think of three Vinods uh, uh, immediately. Uh, Vinod the friend, uh, the computer geek, uh, the person who uh, would sit for hours to install new software in your computers, who uh, installed a game of bridge on my computer, which I still, uh, 25 years later, uh, I still play that on my computer. Uh, he was proud of his accomplishment as a bridge player. Uh, he would talk about it many times. Uh, the Vinod would sing in the evenings, uh, and uh, it was almost like the hours that we would spend during the day uh, would somehow disappear as the note would sing and Anita was uh, someone who whenever she was there uh, she would sing uh, you know the times uh, or the Vinod who loved to share a drink uh, in the evening as we laughed as we argued uh, and we laughed a lot at least in the evening when we were sharing a drink. So that's one Vinod. Then there was the Vinod who, uh, for want of a better word, uh, I might call Vinod the antagonist. Because Vinod was a person who loved to argue. He would love to look at the contrary point of view and we fought a lot, uh, we argued a lot, uh, but at the end of each argument, I think at least some of us uh, felt that our understanding had been sharpened by this arguments that we would have continuously with Vinod. And then there is Vinod the comrade that I've known for the last 30 years. And maybe I'll speak uh, about Vinod the comrade. Uh, about this young physicist which Anita was talking about. Uh, in Delhi University, uh, with a career in front of him, which would have probably taken him uh, a very long way. And then Vinod took a train. He used to talk about this. Uh, he took a train from Delhi to uh, what Anita was uh, describing, Oshangabad district uh, in central India in a backward district. He did not need to take this train. He could have continued to be in the university. He could have continued in what many people consider a promising career. But Vinod 
took a tray and he gets, uh, he used to, uh, he had a figure, right, of the amount that he spent on the train ticket. Uh, uh, it was something like half a dollar at that time. And he, 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 he remembered the, how, much he, uh, how much he spent on that uh, ticket to uh, leave uh, the glamour of uh, university science uh, behind him. Now, this is not all about you know. This is also about the generation for whom science was not a career, for whom science was a passion. Science was a passion where you questioned everything. Science was a passion where you sought the explanation of something when you did not understand how it worked. Science as a passion, when the obvious is not enough to explain something, you are not afraid to look at what is not obvious. So that was the science that Vinod was firstly when he took that train. Uh, and this was the generation, I'm not saying it was just Vinod, but Vinod was a part, uh, a big part of this generation for whom science was a mission, uh, to mission to liberate science from the clutches of what many of us believed was a distortion through the system of capitalism. So science as the liberator of humankind, but also science as the oppressor in the hand of capitalism. So there was this dualism that was part of this generation who moved beyond just doing what many people call good science, to doing science that is meaningful, uh, that actually uh, makes a change in people's... Uh, and as uh, uh, Gos and Anita were pointing out, Vinod was deeply influenced by uh, popular wisdom, by people's knowledge in... Uh, and I would assume much of it came from working with the common people uh, in Hoshangabad. But at the same time, he never romanticized the traditional over the modern. For him, science was both the received wisdom, the wisdom of the people, and science was also what we today make out of it. It was never for we know traditional wisdom versus science today. For him, it was part of science as a whole. Um, for many of us in India, uh, Bhopal, uh, the gas leak in Bhopal was a turning point. Uh, perhaps some of you uh, uh, may not uh, know uh, or remember about it. It is perhaps the worst industrial genocide uh, that we have seen, where in a few hours, 3,000 people who were running away from a poisonous gas, they died running. They were blinded by the gas. Their lungs collapsed. They died because they could run no more. And the gas overtook them. That was what the leak from a factory of Union Carbide uh, did in Bhopal. And 20,000 or more people have died since then because they happened to be in the city where Inan Karbai had a factory. And this was really what put together a lot of people for whom it was not enough to do good science anymore. It had become too important to ignore that science today under capitalism also kills people, as Bhopal showed. And this was really how the people's 
science movement uh, started. And even if I say so, uh, the people's science, science movement uh, in India was quite different from the science movements in different parts of the world. It was a movement of scientists. It was a movement of scientific workers, but not just that. It is a movement of people and the belief that finally it is common people who take science forward. It is finally common people who have a stake in taking science forward. For whom science is not a career. For whom science is important because science can change and change for the better. But at the same time, because science is done in a certain way under capitalism, it is important that common people take charge of how science is done. So this was, this has been the notion of the people science movement, uh, which Vinod uh, and others, and Vinod played a big part in uh, developing this idea of the people science movement which talked about science for the people, science for change and science for social revolution. So this was the people science movement that we dreamt about on those evenings uh, when we shared a drink, when we argued. Part of the dream lives on. The people science movement lives on. Uh, it is about three quarters of a million people in India are directly associated with the people science movement. The people science movement is about looking at the wonders of nature, about something like five million people across the world, across India, uh, looking at the solar eclipse. It is about livelihoods, about people understanding technology, adapting technology, using technology to change, but not receiving as received knowledge, but building over the knowledge that exists over there, exists with them. So, the People Science Movement that Vinod uh, helped build exists, and so Vinod for us uh, exists. Uh, let me uh, finish by the two other Vinod's that I did not talk about. Uh, Vinod the antagonist and Vinod the friend. So we argued a lot, as I said. Uh, and I think if there's one thing that you were to ask me of what I miss, I miss those arguments. I miss arguing with Vinod. And finally, we know the friend. So, uh, when he was in hospital, and uh, I was one of the few people that, uh, when Anita was there, uh, who was allowed to see him because he was in a condition where doctors had said, uh, "Don't, uh, don't go in into the room." And when I went in, and this is what I cherish about Vinod, my friend. Vinod actually said, I'm sorry that I did not tell you about my illness. So this is also the memory of Vinod, my friend that I remember. We miss you, but you're with us. Thank you. Je remercie une nouvelle fois les interprètes pour le travail qu'ils ont fait et j'ai envie de remercier une personne aussi qui est dans cette salle et qui est tout là-haut, c'est Féroce parce que j'ai eu cette idée de rendre un hommage à Philode mais j'ai eu, je vous cache pas que j'ai eu très peur de la charge émotionnelle que ça pouvait représenter pour beaucoup de gens et en particulier pour Anita. Il m'a convaincu que une séance telle que celle-ci était digne d'intérêt et quelques minutes après notre discussion, j'avais déjà envoyé un mail à Anita qui me répondait une heure plus tard que c'était d'accord et qu'elle allait venir. 
J'ai pas eu à convaincre une demi-seconde les, 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 les intervenants de cette, de cette session. Il y en a plusieurs, plusieurs autres qui devaient être là aujourd'hui, qui malheureusement, à cause de l'organisation, de leur investissement, de leur organisation du forum, ne sont pas là. Donc je pense à eux aussi. Je ne vais pas m'étendre, euh, je vais juste vous inviter tous et toutes à rejoindre les autres activités du Forum sur ces démocratie. Il y a un programme là-bas, je vais vous le résumer, mais vous le prendrez sous forme de papier parce qu'on a beaucoup de retard. Je vous invite aussi à venir à la session de clôture de ce forum pour qu'on puisse discuter ensemble de, des différents ateliers, des programmes d'action et, de, et du futur du, du Forum mondial sur ces démocratie. Eh bien merci, c'était une lourde charge émotionnelle, on s'en est bien rendu compte. Merci à tous d'être venus. Voilà, je n'ai pas grand chose à ajouter. Merci beaucoup. Bon forum mondial sur cette démocratie. Bon forum sur cette démocratie.